Welcome back, YouTube. It is that day that many of us, uh, myself included, uh, were beginning to fear would never come again, and that is the day where Chris and I finally go back head-to-head -head in a game of global 1940 Axis and Allies. I am just as excited as you are by this prospect because we haven't started the game yet. So I'm either going to be really happy about it or uh, very disappointed by the outcome, one of the two. I can tell you that uh, in my time, it's probably going to go a whole lot slower than yours because uh, although we're going to be gaming all weekend, we, Chris and I, tend to take our time and think through our moves to the point where it takes... Uh, sometimes weeks or even months uh, to finish a game, uh, especially a couple of working adults with busy families. So uh, that's why we don't get the chance to do this nearly as frequently as we'd like. But here we are uh, entertaining ourselves first and then you guys get to join the party. So a couple things to note here at the outset. Um, New in Chris and I's games, but I've gotten a chance to play in this once already, is the brand new neoprene uh, mat from Renegade Studios. 20% um, larger than the out-of-box version. Mm -hmm. All one piece, so you're not bumping it around and jostling pieces. Um, nice, clean feel to it. Good look, bright colors. Love this thing. Did an unboxing video of it not long ago. Uh, highly recommend for 60 bucks. It is one of the more valuable and uh, certainly cost effective for the value you get out of it. Uh, accessories that you can get for this game. And you know we like our accessories. So you have here the initial setup of the board. Um, I do want to make a couple comments because I hear people like that. And, hey, I like to go back and listen to them myself and remember what I was thinking. Uh, to get a little sense of what the plan is, what the strategy is, uh, before we launch into the game. A little uh, side unpaid commercial here, but I just want to also give a shout out to these toolboxes I found that have been excellent. So I got these two. Keep all my uh, side pieces, accessories, my... Grasshopper hit dice. Can't play a game of Axis and Allies without those. Uh, as well as these uh, pieces here. They're, uh, Mastercraft is the brand. Uh, they come from some, some company. I could look it up. but um, it, I found them in the container store. They're obviously meant for hardware. Psh, who'd want to use them for that, right? These are the perfect game pieces. Game boxes for Axis and Allies, 1940 pieces. We've got one for each country, and uh, they are super helpful. So, back to the board. You'll see, as usual, Paris is... Uh, we just set it straight up on the battle board, because why not? That's... Uh, of all the things that need to happen in Axis and Allies, that is the most inevitable. Um, that said, so, I've tried many Axis strategies over the years. Some have been fruitful, some have not, some I want to revisit. And I'll tell you, it's been so long that I've got at least three strategies cooking in my head um, that I'd really love to give a try. But uh, this is what I'm going to go for. And I'm going to tell you, this is risky. There are so many ways uh -huh. that it could go wrong um, that I'm almost embarrassed to talk about it. But I, I need to do it because, you know, why not? You got to give it a try at least once and see if you can make it happen. It We may bail out of it early, um, but we'll see. Here's what I intend to happen. And, you know, no plan survives contact with the enemy. But here's what I have mapped out in my head. I won't go through all the details, but the, the basic um, intent of the strategy is to do something I've never really seriously attempted with the Axis before, and that's to begin the game by putting pressure on the United States. Um, I, I will say that I took partial inspiration. It was already something I was starting to cook and something that I've mod modified a bit from what I read, but I did read a post uh, on the uh, Axis and Allies forum uh, who, from a, a player who played a game where they uh, invaded the U.S. Um, I'm not going to do exactly what they did, but 
kind of wanted to see if I could make that happen uh, in my own way. So we're going to start off. It's basically a sea line move for Germany. And in fact, I want to telegraph uh, a sea lion uh, preparation so clearly that it couldn't have been telegraphed any more clearly if it was sent by Western Union. I want I want Chris to have no doubt that in axis um, sea line move is what I'm going for. So I'm going to obviously take out as much of the British Navy as I can. I'm going to bring my land units over, park them over here on the west side. Uh, I want to try and take Normandy and Yugoslavia if I can um, for the income for Germany so they have more money to build more transports on G2. And I'm planning on building an aircraft carrier in either two transports or maybe a destroyer and a sub or destroyer or sub and one transport, something like that, in 112. Why is that? Well, um, that aircraft carrier, that used to be the default start when we are going to do a sea line, but the aircraft carrier is going to stay there in 112 to protect the fleet of transports that I hope to build there um, on Germany's second turn. Why in 112 instead of 113? Well, um, that keeps them from being bottlenecked by a blocker in 112. It may be that I drop them in 113, but there there's another reason for that because the real move um, on G2 is to take uh, what else is in the fleet, which is going to be um, one transport that was already there at the beginning of the game, the battleship, the cruiser, they're all going to be in 112 at the end of the first turn as well. And they're going to go one, two, three, up to Iceland. We are going to occupy Iceland. And I'm planning on taking the battleship and the cruiser with me to protect the one transport that's able to go up there. And if I build another transport on uh, G1, uh, that might be able to go up there as well. So they stay in range of London for a sea line move, if that is in fact what I end up doing with those folks. Um, and so as far as Chris knows, uh, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm encircling and taking what I can and sp splitting up my fleet, but still keeping them in range of London for a G3 or for um, sea line attack. And that is, in fact, what I want to be able to uh, retain the capability to do. But my goal here, and this is the critical part of the entire plan, my goal is on G3 to take the transport from Iceland, go 1, 2 here to 121. You'll see that touches uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. I want to drop at least a German land unit into Alberta. I want to occupy Alberta. I'm not coming into uh, Alberta to, you know, roll through and conquer all of Canada. Uh, it'd be swell if that happened, but that's not my primary goal. My primary goal is not even to take Ottawa, although that is a uh, high value secondary goal. And there's a couple ways that the plan could unfold where that happens. Um, and that matters because our house rules say that uh, UK's capital moves to Ottawa if, in fact, London is taken. So uh, occupying Alberta, though, is the primary goal. Why is that? Why is it important to occupy Alberta, of all places, on G3? Well, that's because we're, of course, coordinating with our <laughs> Axis brethren over here in the Pacific, the Japanese. The Japanese, I'm going to do something that is going to seem crazy. It's going to feel crazy. It may even turn out to be crazy. Um, but it's going to be the San Francisco crush. Um, why do we call it that? Well, it's because it's a version of the infamous Calcutta crush, which involves, uh, Japan bringing all of its Navy down here to Hong Kong or Hainan rather season 36 in the first turn, sliding them on a non-com basis over here to season 39 and then launching a Calcutta invasion on Japan's third or fourth turn. Uh, it, it's able to do that because it doesn't start the game at war with the UK. So it's able to just peaceably move its navy all the way through the British fleet and into position for where it wants to uh, invade. So this is the San Francisco version of that move. Um, I might even call this the rice attack. 
because it's the San Francisco treat. So we'll bring the fleet, uh, a good portion of the fleet here into Hawaii on turn one. Some of them are probably going to come up the north way because one important part of the plan is occupying Soviet Far East, and we'll mention why in a second. Second turn, those same Japanese naval units will be coming up here to Sea Zone 10, uh, maybe some to Sea Zone 1 as well. But we don't want to get any farther than that. We don't want to leave them in Sea Zone 26 because then when they start to do an attack and now these Americans can block them, we don't need any blockers. Chris is really adept at blocking my movements by dropping one little ship there to prevent them from moving where they want to go. So we're not going to let that happen if we can help it. Rather, we're going to slide these guys in on J1 and J2. And the goal being launching an attack that can take out the U.S. Navy in C-Zone 10. Uh, hopefully eliminating that Navy. And we'll have at least three transports, maybe more depending on what I build and what turn the attack happens on. Those three transports are probably, let's be real, they're probably not going to occupy the Western United States because he will see this coming. And in fact, the goal is to make sure he sees this coming, right? Uh, we don't want him to have any uh, illusions about the fact that Japan's coming for him. Mm -hmm. So he's gonna build and hopefully, my, my goal here, at least my anticipation, is that he'll build a lot of naval units here to uh, counteract that naval attack. Um, he may he end up building land units once he sees transports in range. Uh, he's going to be getting ready. But this will put the Americans on the defensive from the beginning of the game, keeping them hopefully weaker, ultimately, in being able to project power later in the game. That's a big portion of the strategy. So how does this tie into Alberta? Well, on J3, all these folks are coming in and I've run the odds on this and I'm running the odds based on the assumption that he's going to spend all of his builds on U.S. turns one and two, putting naval units in C-Zone 10. Now, it may very well turn out that he won't do that. In fact, I'm hoping he won't do that because that'll make my job a whole heck of a lot easier. But this plan it doesn't even have a shred of plausibility unless I'm able to beat that Navy, even if he boosts it all the way up on these first two turns. Now, you mentioned, you remember I said that I was going to telegraph a sea line move. Well, when there's a sea line move coming, what the U.S. usually does is pile a whole lot of Navy into the Atlantic so that it's able to come to London's rescue as soon as possible. So he's going to have pressure to build in the Atlantic. Then on the same first turn, Japan is going to telegraph in no uncertain terms that it's coming for San Francisco. Well, that should uh, incentivize him to at least be defensive here. It may very well be that he sees the bigger threat as being the Atlantic, and so he'll let the Pacific go, or at least not build up as much. Maybe he only builds land units to prevent invasion, but more or less gives up on the naval battle. Um, that's fine. That makes Japan's job easier. And, you know, I'm anticipating that in the Atlantic, so we'll talk about how we can deal with that. But, like I said, the plan's not worth doing unless it's able to beat him um, no matter what he does. So, Let's move on the assumption that he spends two turns building up in C-Zone 10. In that case, I have to bring everything I have as a Navy, the entire Japanese Navy, coming into C-Zone 10, plus as much air power as I can get there. The, the planes that can come on the three carriers that I own just aren't going to be enough. I think I'm going to buy... I, I get... Navies that I can buy on turn one that will be able to make it there by turn three. I'm planning on building subs just because my goal is to take out the Navy and they can only hit ships. So that uh, is probably the most cost-effective way to spend those 26 IPCs. Keep in mind, too, that destroying all of the surface warships uh, the U.S. has in the Pacific is one of the victory tokens in our house rules. So the ultimate outcome here the ideal outcome would be taking out all that Navy and being able to get that victory token pretty early in the game. 
Um, but if he builds everything in Season 10 for two turns, uh, the air power I can bring on those carriers is not enough. How do I beat that? Well, two ways. Uh, you bring strat bombers, you land strat bombers in the Soviet Far East on turn two and fly them in on turn three. So they need to, you need to take that territory on turn one in order to make that happen. And I need to bring six planes, three jets and three tack bombers, and have them take off from Japan. They can go one, two, three, four, five. Taking off from an airbase, they use all their movement to get into the C-Zone 10. They're able to land on the carriers, so that's a legal move. Um, by the same token, the strat bombers can go one, two, three, four, have three left, but they don't have anywhere to land. So how do I make those things happen? How, specifically, if I'm gonna land those planes from Japan on those carriers, the planes that are already on the carriers have to have a legal landing spot too. And even if they're already in C-Zone 10, which is what I intend, uh, they go one and then they've got three more spaces to go. Where are they gonna land? Well, the answer is Alberta, baby. One, to the Western US or to Canada, maybe two to Western Canada. If they happen to be, they can go here, one, two to Western Canada. Uh, in any event, Western Canada borders Alberta. So if the Germans have occupied Alberta on turn three, then the Japanese can land their planes there on turn three. Now, that may, depending on how many Germans are there, how many planes make it, and how much he has on the ground, that, you know, could end up being a bad idea. He, he's got air power that can reach. Um, central U.S. borders Alberta, that little sliver of land right there. Um, so if he's got land units that can reach and he's got some mobile units there, um, that could end up putting some undue pressure on me. Um, so that could end up being ultimately a bad thing. Okay, I, great. I took out the Navy, landed all my aircraft there, and now he can pound them to death. Um, that might be a bad thing. Uh, it may be that Alberta doesn't get taken, which means Japan either has to call off that attack Try to pull it off without the extra air support, which you know is plausible if he doesn't build up the navy like I'm afraid he might. Um, or wait till Japan's fourth turn, um, which is of course possible. But then all that activity up here in the north starts to put his sh my ships way out of position and give him way too much opportunity to take advantage of it. So what are the major downsides of this strategy? <laughs> It's what I'm not doing, right? I'm not doing all the things that I normally would do with both of these countries. And what that's going to do, it's going to, in the Pacific, it's going to let um, the uh, Indians down here and Anzac just get stupid because they're going to have at least three turns to build up. Uh, my Now, my goal here is, okay, after I build on Japan's first turn, maybe even the second turn if I need some more planes, um, then third turn and hopefully second turn, I'm building stuff can, that can then come down here and start doing what I'm supposed to do in the Pacific. I'm hoping that I'm going to have a big enough Navy left here that I'm just dominating the Pacific, can come down to Hawaii, take that, and then easily um, swish down here to give Anzac a hard time, get back into the fight in the Southern Pacific, hopefully not lose too much ground. Um, but depending how early... Uh, Chris gets wise to the overall plan and how badly he wants to take advantage of what I'm going to leave as a power vacuum down here. He could easily declare war on me with these two countries. Doesn't bring the U.S. in, but he's not going to need them if um, Japan's not doing its job down here. If it's not, He's going to occupy these money islands real quick to get bonuses for his guys. He might want to declare war just so he can start getting his national objective bonuses, but the inevitability here is that these two countries are going to become much more problematic to deal with. By the same token, Russia is what I'm really afraid of, because anytime you do a sea line, every single time you do a sea line, uh, and especially if Chris is playing them, Russia just gets super aggressive. He's going to buy a ton of tanks, uh, planes, bombers, fast movers, and he's going to just pile up on this border 
waiting to spill into German territory as soon as he gets the opportunity. And the more time I spend building up over here, the harder time I'm going to have coming back in Eastern Europe. I saw that uh, in the last game I played um, myself in Detroit when um, I wasn't able to get back in time and Russia actually full-on occupied Berlin. Um, hopefully it, would, it doesn't come to that. Uh, you know, never did talk about what the sea line move is going to be. So Germany's third turn. If that one transport from Iceland is able to occupy Alberta, that's enough. Um, I may have, depending on what he builds, he's going to build smartly here. So he's going to build um, super defensively in London. I'm very likely not going to have enough to get in on G3. Uh, I may very well dump guys in Scotland and then, you know, come pick up some more and do the sea lion on Germany 4. Uh, at that point, of course, Russia gets into the game and I'll have to start defending against them. Hopefully, I'll be able to build, build up some defenses, set up some defenses so that I can slow them down and ultimately push them back. Uh, but, you know, depending on how this goes, I may scratch the plan altogether. If, if U.S. isn't building up in the Pacific to the point where Japan needs Alberta, well, that makes it a lot more easy for Germany. I got more things that I can do. Um, but the whole linchpin, if I want to pull off the Alberta thing, the whole linchpin is being able to get there on the third turn. Uh, and all he has to do is throw up a blocker in season 122 or 121, and then I'm in trouble. And I'm, I've been wringing my hands trying to figure out how to do that. Because look, it takes me three moves just to get to Iceland on turn two. I'm not going to have the ability to to go take this out. And if there's somebody in 121, maybe I bring my battleship, my cruiser, and I'm able to, to kill that ship and then drop off in Alberta. But if he's in 122, uh, I am in big trouble because I can't get through that and then also drop in Alberta. Now, I could build a naval base there so I could go down and around, get three movement points. I could take out the blocker and, and then wait till Germany 4. Both of those things re require me to wait till Germany's fourth turn. Um, but again, it starts to take too much time. Um, there is there is a scenario in which that could actually turn out to be a great thing. I'm spending a lot of time, yes, but it lets me build up. Like I said before, sea line's probably not going to happen until the fourth turn if it happens at all. So maybe... Here's, here's a scenario. I don't, I don't know that it's going to happen, but here's a scenario. My whole sea lion fleet moves up to 123 on the third turn. And then I'm able to send enough to not only get to London. I'd have to build a naval base, of course. Uh, but also go 1, 2, 3 into sea zone 120. Drop them in Ottawa. And now I've taken both UK capitals on the same turn. He doesn't get to switch capitals. I actually get to take his money and keep it. And the UK is screwed because he can't build anything uh, until one of those two capitals are taken back. So um, that would be the ideal outcome. That requires a number of things to go the right way uh, in my favor before uh, that could even become a possibility. And I've got to play it and the dice have got to roll just right, just perfectly. But that is the, that is the ultimate perfect scenario that could happen. Uh, not saying that it will. So if anything falls apart early, maybe I bail on the sea line plan. Maybe I take those transports, go a different direction with them up into Russia uh, and turn that way. But uh, which is always the backup plan, right? When you're building up a sea line and it's not going in your favor. Uh, but either way, Russia is going to be a monster. Calcutta, Anzac, they're all going to be problematic. And it's definitely going to be a unique game because we're trying a strategy we've never played before. Never thought we'd come up with them, but hey, we keep coming up with them. Like I said, I've got three cooking around in my head that I'd really love to give a try. And maybe one of these days we'll all get to play him. So here we go with the next game. We are halfway through turn one, and things have progressed unusually compared to the average game. So we see in the Pacific, the Japanese have built four subs and moved 
all the Navy they could into C-Zone 26 by Hawaii. That is not something we often see. Um, ran into a little bit of a rules clarification there. So we never do this sort of move. So we, uh, or at least I should say, uh, was unaware of the uh, restriction on Japanese movement in the global rules that you can't end your sea zone uh, within two season or you can't you know, see unit move within two sea zones of mainland U.S. Uh, we did a little digging online since the print rules are a bit ambiguous on this point. Turns out Larry Harris himself has weighed in that that includes Western and Alaska and also that you count uh, sea zone 10 as number one. Um, meaning that C-Zone 26 is legal, but you can't park any Japanese in 10, 12, 9, 1, and so forth, all the way around there, that perimeter there. So that's why, for example, that transport, who was originally going to go to C-Zone 3, uh, was pulled back to C-Zone 4. Um, no bigs, but an interesting uh, discovery that we've been playing this game, what, 10 years now, and we're still learning uh, pieces of the rules that we've never exploited before. So that's the situation in the Pacific, China, uh, natural progression inward on the European map. Um, as anticipated, Germany with a very uh, UK Western front focused uh, move here. So everything... Um, well, the sub battles anyway over here went well. There's uh, some, there's actually still some subs left in the Atlantic for once, so uh, UK won't get that bonus. But boy, did I under uh, commit to C Zone 111 because I pl I kept the sub out, the sub that was in 118 went to 119, or not 119, but one of that C Zone there, um, and put just one sub and some planes into 111. He scrambled the plane from Scotland. We stuck with it. We killed everything there, but he killed everything. Beginning of turn two, the U.S. has reacted to Japan's aggression by consolidating its fleet here in C-Zone 10 and building almost all of its builds there, bringing everybody back from Hawaii, putting another carrier there, there's one sub built in the Atlantic, otherwise everything built here, all the planes, all the mobile units that could get there from Central got there. And we've got a strong showing of force there in the Pacific. Uh, the other two little American boats down here in 54 with the Anzacians who are slowly building up um, as one might expect. Uh, as also to be expected when Japan's not projecting into the Southern Pacific, the Allies have taken the advantage here and the uh, opportunity to occupy these Dutch islands, which really is a rule I don't much care for, that they can uh, start occupying these territories uh, when they're not even at war. But nevertheless, there you go. Uh also, India getting aggressive, buying offensive units, moving up into Burma, taking advantage of the Japanese power vacuum, and move, starting to move into the Middle East. So, with Sea Lion on the table, we didn't see a Taranto raid, which means Italy actually gets to do something this game. Uh, and it chose to occupy Gibraltar, Morocco, and Tunisia, spreading out that way, taking out the French fleet. Uh, so you could get a couple bonuses and with uh, Greece and Southern and pose to get a couple more, perhaps, if things go their way. Uh, meanwhile, the Americans, um, like I said, building one sub. The British, though, um, taking that cruiser and bomber, everything that could get to 106, handily taking out the two subs that lived there, meaning that the one in 119 got to survive but its convoy was useless so good thing we sacrificed half the Luftwaffe so that that sub could live um let's see if Germany can pick up the pace here on turn two now halfway through turn two and things aren't looking so bad for the Axis um Japan is continuing its push towards America with uh bringing the entire fleet 
into C zone 26 again, countering the buildup that uh, the uh, Americans did in Western US, building uh, more fleet to carriers to subs and bringing back the transports from Russia into C zone six to uh, redistribute some forces there. A orderly progression into China, as one might expect at this point. So that's Japan's turn. No de declaration of war on the U.S. yet. On the German side, well, and one more thing you should see that the Soviet Far East folks have decided to uh, double back the other way now and, and head back towards those occupied territories. Russia just continues to pile up its... Um, offensive forces as, again, you would expect um, when Germany's leaving its front wide open, piling up that stack right there in eastern Poland, getting ready to just plow into a very sparsely populated Germany at this point. Germany, you'll see, um, starting to form a line here on the eastern front, but nowhere near the size of a stack, but is staring down over that uh, border. Meanwhile, though... Um, Germany's position vis-a-vis -vis London is, um, while certainly uh, not enviable given the loss of Air Force, still um, slightly better than it was before. At least uh, they still got the fighting spirit. So they've not only occupied Normandy there, but also Scotland. So redirecting um, some forces that way, occupying them uh, with the two transports that were built as well as a couple paratroopers taking advantage of that rule. So um, that's four infantry and two artillery there in Scotland. The uh, rest of the Navy, the entire German Navy, swinging around, consolidating in 109 to be able to drop those folks off and uh, make a stand there uh, with the UK Navy over here in 106 threatening to come back and bring its Canadian troops into the fray now that German Navy is standing in the gap there. So will the Allies overcome the Axis momentum here in the rest of turn two? Hey, so this is an interlude where it's just you and me talking about strategy here while we are on a meal break. So a couple things. Uh, for one, the idea of Japan putting pressure on the U.S. so that they build everything in the Pacific and he dumps all his money there to defend against Japan rather than building up an Atlantic fleet that can um, uh, harass Germany while they're trying to do a sea line. That overall kind of meta strategy is working and it's working really well and I'm very happy with it. Uh, there is nothing going on in the Atlantic to the extent that, um, that we, so we just finished the U.S. turn. We're still in the middle of the Allies' turn here on turn two, by the way. Um, he moved everything out of Eastern. Um, there's nothing there. All he's built there is one sub, but everything else is going into the Pacific Theater. Um, that's a good situation for Germany. Japan is doing its job of taking the American pressure off of Germany so that it can get its sea lion done and then have only Russia to worry about and not both Russia and the U.S. That's what usually happens even when I can pull off a successful sea lion, which is not, you know, as often as I'd like. Um, the Americans are right there with a the fleet to either sink the German fleet or take London back or just make it a mess while Russia is trying to clean up on the other side. That's not happening this time. I'm super pleased with that. Um, I can't remember the last time I played Chris and he didn't uh, just completely annihilate Italy out of the box. So it's kind of fun to be able to do something with them right now. Uh, the plane thing. So, shoot, uh, of all the things that happen here. Uh, <laughs> okay, so those are the positives. All right. Those are the positives. Um, a couple of uh, just really stark negatives as well. The one is the decision to pull that sub out. Once I made the game time decision to build um, a sub and a transport along with that carrier, that's really what I was debating up to the very last minute. I didn't know if it was going to be two transports, if it was going to be a sub and a destroyer or what. I went with sub and 
transport saving a buck, which I think was the best move. It gave me that extra transport to work with, and it gave me the sub, which um, keeps him from getting the bonus for no subs in the Atlantic if all my sub battles go poorly, which, you know, they would have. Um, uh, and so would have kept that sub in there and prevented him from getting that balance, re that bonus regardless, but I think it's the only three IPCs. Give me a little bit of extra protection over here, which is nice, but pulling that sub out of the battle, keeping it in 119 over there, um, really screwed me. I think he rolled well enough that I would have taken some hits on the Air Force anyway, but then if I hadn't brought... If I had brought that sub in, would he have even scrambled the plane? I don't know. Um, but to lose two planes and two tacks on Germany's first turn is just really, really bad. Which, frankly, is why I'm utterly shocked that um, Germany's turn two has gone so well. The Having as much Navy as I did gave me the opportunity to flex that muscle, put it here in 109, and what that does is it's convoying the heck out of him. That's a convoy marker, by the way. Um, and with that much fleet, he's never going to risk throwing all of his Air Force at that fleet. But you know what? Let's say he does and he wins. Let's say he sinks that entire fleet. Well, that's only two of the 11 transports that are waiting to come in the next turn. And because he has brought all of his remaining fleet over here... Um, he can't block my progress with these two transports. I mean, I suppose he could build a ship there. Um, that would be interesting. Um, so, sure, he he destroys my fleet, builds a destroyer there. None of my transports can get there. I don't know. I'd still attack with the planes. Um, I don't think he's going to do that. That would be suicidal. So, I'm guaranteed to bring all my troops in. I've got land units on Scotland, a fair number, more than I would have able, been able to if I hadn't built that extra transport. Um, I'm really well positioned for a G3 sea lion. So far running the numbers, they look pretty optimistic. Uh, nothing's set in stone, but I can also afford to wait till G4 if I have to because the Americans aren't doing anything. So um, Germany's been able to pull it together a lot better than I would have expected. Now, you noticed I bailed on the whole Iceland thing, which was kind of uh, a key part of the strategy, not so much strategically, just fun-wise. I wanted to be able to threaten Washington, D.C. and Ottawa with a fleet in Iceland uh, and a naval base up there that could project that power to those two capitals. Um, depending on how things go, you know, maybe that's a mid-game uh, maneuver. But that would have been a lot of fun. But overall, strategically, taking London is always the bigger prize and being able to do it um, without the Americans there, super cool. Um, these Italians now, because they've taken Gibraltar and they've got their whole fleet still alive, they can do a couple things. They can go back this way with the whole fleet uh, towards Egypt. I I really wish I would have gone towards Alexandria now. I didn't because I didn't want him to double back and wipe out that fleet there, that uh, force there in Alexandria, as he could have. Um but it keeps me from being able to take Egypt this turn. Never mind, I can still bring the fleet over, take Jordan, take Syria, Cyprus, something, uh, to keep the momentum going over there. I also have the option of going west, taking maybe Brazil, although I wish I would have brought an extra infantry to Gibraltar there. Um, any one of these South American territories, which under our house rules, every territory I own in um, the Americas is a plus two, so... That could add up, and he's got so little he can do about it. Now, the Italians, of all people, are threatening Washington, D.C. They could take Mexico. They could take West Indies uh, and really make a nuisance of themselves. That would be utterly fantastic, and I'm so sorely tempted to try that just because. Um, so that was, that was the one bad thing that happened. The other really, really uh, abysmally and unforgivably stupid thing uh, that happened here is... You know, that whole thing about Alberta, how I needed to land the planes there so the Japanese could have a place to land. Well, it would have been nice if I had read the rule book and realized that Japan can't end the uh, movement of its naval zones within two spots of the western U.S. or Alaska, for that matter. 
Uh, and that kind of was part and parcel to everything I wanted to do with Japan, was to be able to float them in um, like a Calcutta crush, except going the other direction, and just wipe out the American fleet that way. Um, yeah, that would have been nice, but oh well, didn't work out that way. Um, again, that was a tactic that I wanted to use, but the overall strategy of putting pressure on U.S. and keeping them in the Pacific is certainly working. I love it. Uh, you'll see, as expected, last turn he threw up some destroyer blockers. Cheesy move, but um, exactly what I would have done in his position. And exactly as we predicted, the Indians and the Anzacs are going crazy down here. I tell you what, I am surprised, honestly, that he didn't declare war with both of them yet. We're going into turn two. Frankly, I think he'll do that this turn. He's got no reason not to, um, because Japan isn't in a great position to uh, retaliate, and he knows Japan's going to attack him next turn probably anyway. Certainly going to attack the U.S. next turn, which you know, ultimately will bring these guys in soon enough. Um, so I will be very surprised if he does not declare war with the two of these on turn two, just to start getting some bonuses. But you see they're gobbling up the Money Islands, um, they're building up a navy, building up a land force down here in India. But, you know, I knew all that going in. I knew that was the risk. The Chinese position is still pretty good. He's starting to remember that because Russia is doing so well in Germany, I'm sure he's going to shoot those mechs that he just built over here to supplant China, which he always does. Um, these guys back here marching back over to Japan, that's fine. I'd rather... Japan have to deal with them right now, frankly, than Germany. Germany's got enough Russians on its hands. Um, but it's going to be a lot for Japan to handle while it's messing with the Americans. This next turn, I can't go into the fleet, which means he gets another free turn to build up, uh, which is unfortunate, honestly. Um, but we can build up one more turn, too. We can move that fleet closer, start taking out these destroyers, putting them right there. Hopefully that gives us still the um, defensive capability to survive a counter-strike. But um, we'll see where that goes. i got to run some numbers while we're doing dinner here. And that's the end of my little strategic interlude. Beginning of turn three, the Allies have pushed back a bit. So uh, as we see, the Americans have built again in Pacific, trying to keep up with the Japanese threat. Put out a couple of cheesy destroyer blockers here to prevent the attack on C-Zone 10. Meanwhile, the British and the Anzac forces have, as expected, declared war and uh, allowed themselves to get bonuses. And in the meantime, gobbled up the rest of the Money Islands. I think Anzac uh, just received 31? 20 plus 11 in bonuses. It's a lot. It's a lot of money. Um, so he's built up his little empire here, realizing that the Japanese were out of his back door. He's done some defensive building. That's a pillbox along with some more land units pulled back. Well, not all that defensive since the planes are out here in Java. The UK, uh, saw this move, thought he might do it and he did it. Uh, took the opportunity to, um, throw everything they possibly could at the Japanese Air Force in Quang C, which had not been insulated by any land units, so they were there unprotected. He was able to shave off quite a few. I think he took off, um, if I'm not mistaken, a plane, three tacks, and two strats. So he traded uh, everything he had in um, India or in Burma and in Sumatra to get that, and you know, it's not a bad trade. Um, Chinese pulling back as you'd expect, the Indians pulling into the Middle East as you'd expect, getting those bonuses, and uh, reinforcing Egypt, not ready to bail on that just yet, uh, pulling back these guys that were down in the Horn of Africa, and bringing them back to reinforce Egypt. Italy, weighing its options, decided to get the rest of its bonuses, so pulled the Navy Forward into Alexandria and into Transjordan, beef those up as much as possible, uh, finish taking Algeria so that we're getting um, bonuses all around here um, for the, the, the key cities, the northern Africa, as well as the Med. 
Um, so Italy is doing all right for itself within the first two turns. Building up some ground forces though, anticipating uh, that not all is going to stay quiet on the Eastern Front for too long. And although triggering war by invading London is looking less likely after the UK turn, UK pulling off what would really the best possible move available to them, which was taking those Canadian forces supported by the London Air Force. You, know, you wouldn't expect the London Air Force necessarily to uh, risk itself, but with those uh, ground troops from Canada, they weren't uh, risking enough and were able to wipe out bad roles for Germany, able to wipe out everything that was there. I think, what, Germany got one hit, two hits out of the whole deal. Um, so plenty of land units left over in Scotland. Uh, the odds had on in London invasion have now gone from by one calculation, 75% in my favor to uh, a much less number. So we're going to see what the Axis can do to regroup here on turn three. Halfway turn three, and the battle is joined. Japan and the U.S. finally at odds. And that comes with Japan occupying Hawaii this time and using a couple subs and planes to clear out the blocker destroyers from sea zones 9 and 12. So now that uh, stuff is getting real, uh, we have the possibility of a real confrontation between these two navies, should we decide to go that way, but Japan now has more movement options sitting on a naval base and um, more possibilities open up. Everybody is at war. The rest of Japan's moves, we used some planes and subs to clear out 36. That was just something that had to go, right? He threw that Navy out there in order to accomplish what he did, knowing that it was vulnerable, and I had to take advantage of it while it was still vulnerable to get rid of that battleship and transport and everything else. So that was necessary. Uh, Asia, we are regrouping. So we've pulled back, started to form some stacks there. That's 11 infantry, 4 artillery, a gun, 4 planes, all in Anway, plus a major factory there in Kiangsu, some investment in the Asian uh, mainland that can't wait any longer, especially with these um, absurd number of Russians up there in Amur getting ready to plunge downward, uh, no doubt, to add another front to Japan's worries with the UK and China and Russia all coming into the Chinese front. Um, they are dead set on keeping Japan busy. Um, almost forget what happened on Germany's turn because it uh, seems like it happened hours ago, which it probably did. But here's what happened. The Germans stuck with the Sea Lion um, battle plan not backing off from that, but rather combining the fleet and swinging it around the aisles to drop as many folks as possible into Scotland. That's 11 infantry, six tanks, some artillery, even an AA gun this time to kind of keep the uh, defense up against who knows what will come out of London. But German committed to that plan of action. So the Russians uh, just waiting to make them pay for it here. Um, on turn four when they finally get the chance to attack and some strap bombers everything else so all sorts of offensive capabilities coming out of russia will the allies slow down the advance on the rest of turn three welcome to the beginning of turn four so um we did the interlude video talking about what the allies might do and this is the option they chose um all things being equal, probably the most likely, as we talked about. And it is consistent with his pressure uh, tactics on Japan. So the entire American fleet flies up to Sea Zone 4, drops its um, land units there, spends almost the entire build here in Western, building 10 infantry and a few other things in Central that can quickly get to Western. Um, in order to ward off this ginormous Japanese fleet that is now 
um, within striking distance of San Francisco. A blocker there in 25 for some reason. Um, I think we can speculate as to why that would be. Uh, otherwise, in the Pacific, we have slow but steady growth on the part of India and Australia. We see uh, defensive builds here in the Australian mainland while the and Zakistani adventurers occupy Siam, and that's a Australian roundel on the Asian mainland, not a, a frequent occurrence. Um, slow but steady growth of the Indian army as it extends up to Yunnan, this big stack that it's taking. We've got Chinese markers now on originally held Japanese territory, not exactly comforting for the Japanese in the Middle East, slow growth towards Iraq, and, and more or less abandonment of Egypt, recognizing the superior numbers of the Italians, which did, did in fact roll through, rather than bringing additional land units in via Navy, we pulled the Navy back to the home zone where it can re-up, reload, and relaunch. Um, the Americans did something funky by sending its transport, loan transport here to Gibraltar with a guy in an artillery. So we sent the only Italians that could reach was the uh, transport here that was in 97 and shot over the guy in artillery with bomber support. Uh, too bad those both Americans hit on the first roll, killed the Italian land units. Bomber lived to survive another day, but the Allies continue to occupy Gibraltar. Atlantic is quiet, but it's about to get noisy here in turn four. Now halfway through turn four, and uh, despite some dice rolling in drama here and there, the Axis turn went pretty much as anticipated at least on my end, um, from what I planned to do at the beginning of the turn. So, as you'd expect, the Japanese fleet has largely uh, relocated to C-Zone 6 because of that uh, well-placed blocker in Midway. I wasn't able to come in there on the combat phase, so I wasn't able to invade Korea. Um, and, of course, he only would have put that blocker there if he intended to invade Korea, so... Not a surprise to see that happen. Uh, one guy there in, in Korea, the rest of the Soviets there, Manchuria, um, coming in with force. We've been able to uh, reallocate the Japanese forces in China so that there's an equal and opposite force there opposing the Manchurians in Jihol. And, of course, all mess of Japanese ships and planes and whatnot in C-Zone 6 to support whatever happens next time around. Um, built a couple transports and land units all the way through, uh, especially here in the factory in Shanghai, because boy howdy, the uh, allies are all coming. It's, um, is, is every single, every single ally is part of this invasion force. I don't remember the last time I saw an allied cooperative team consisting of the Chinese, the Russians, the Americans, the British, the French, and even the Australians. Oh, look at that. All in one coordinated assault. That is impressive in and of itself. Um, I don't know the last time you've seen an Anzac marker, like I said, but uh, we've got Chinese markers. We've got uh, Anzac troops. We've got French troops supporting... Uh, the Chinese and the Russian strat bombers and the Indian forces. So this is this is quite an effort over here. One for the history books. On the European side, like I said, some dice rolling drama, but the uh, Nazis did end up occupying London. Uh, sadly, if this were real life, but it's a game. So uh, fun to see uh, a successful invasion. Um, so many times I've played this game and been all hopped up to do Sea Lion and then forgot that he could scramble into the naval zone and kill my 11 transport. So, um, there is a second where I almost let that go again, but remembered 
to uh, double check that. They ended up pull, pulling back enough planes to cover the naval assault. Um, that, of course, you know, prolonged the land battle, but nevertheless, um, ended up victorious as the odds calculators uh, predicted that I should. Um, boy, the Soviets, though, as anticipated, right? I mean, when you give them four turns to build up and you don't put any Germans on the Eastern Front, this is what happens. A uh, whole lot of Soviet markers, getting a whole lot of bonuses. Good thing our house rules knock that down to two per instead of three per territory, but that is still just a stupid amount of money. Uh, it's it's worth noting, too, for those of you who play with our house rules, um, you know, we, we've ascertained that we really need to restore the bonus for taking London, and I would argue the bonus for controlling Denmark and Norway as well, because look, look at this. Germany occupies London, which is a victory token in our book, so it's not for nothing. Um, but they get no bonuses right now. They're doing this well, and they have no bonuses. That's that's silly when, especially when these other countries are getting crazy bonuses. So um, we've we've noted that as something to fix in the next rules. We are playing with three point three right now, and we're going to bump that up to three point four, I believe. Um, so we'll publish those in the comments. And Germans just buying a whole lot of infantry. Hoping they can continue to slow the Allied roll. Oh. Here on the rest of turn four. We've reached the beginning of turn five. America has implemented what we have for over oh, the past 30 odd years called the Alaskan Forward Naval Strategy, which is positioning its fleet in the Alaskan waters, building a naval base there as a launching off point into Japan. Pulled those guys back from the Soviet Far East and regrouped there in Sea Zone 1. So that's what the U.S. is committing to, building a now a secondary fleet to flush out the subs from Sea Zone 10 and to supplement the strategy. Um, not before I convoyed them pretty heavily though so that was a worthy investment um down here the little japanese transport that could got into new britain and took eight ipcs and bonuses away so that was useful the asian front continues to be just atrocious for japan the indians um Continuing to supply new units every turn, pushing forth uh, further and further into China, getting now just on the border of my factory. Uh, again, surrounded by the most diverse multinational force uh, to be seen on this board. And on the European front, the second half of the turn included the British bringing the fleet back and taking Egypt, um, not without some effort, though. Uh, only one tank survived the battle, so Italy came back down and retook it. Of course, um, there's still quite a few British fellows on the board and uh, some capability there that they're bringing, so uh, it remains to be seen which direction they go with those forces, but Italy... In the meantime, continuing to build land units, uh, decided to take those land units into Slovakia, Hungary, uh, laying down the groundwork and indeed the red carpet for the Germans to uh, walk in and supplement their resistance to the communist wave pouring into Europe. Can't stand for that. Um, in the meantime, the Americans Finally activating Brazil. A um, little bit of a controversy here. If you look, roll back the video, I didn't have uh, as much American Navy in 91. Um, Chris did on his map. We decided to let that go. Um, so that sub was able to take out that transport, which I would not have put there had I realized that there was a sub there. Uh, that's going to be, you know, just one of the things you chalk up to the inefficiencies of playing a game over FaceTime. So there was a insufficient communication there um, resulted in that move, but unlikely to be critical. And 
That's what the Atlantic looks like. How will the Germans spend and utilize all that money they just took on turn five? Now the middle of turn five and Japan, although sorely, sorely tempted by other options, alternatives that we can talk about at a different time, has uh, come to the conclusion it needs to retrench in Asia here and beat back the invading land forces. So um, Russia helped it make that decision by pouring everything from Manchuria into G-Hole, supported by its three bombers, including the one that it had built in Moscow. That battle went, I'd say, pretty even to odds. It, it eliminated all the infantry and uh, one of the bombers, left four artillery that then came and cleaned up Manchuria, supported by this navy, which uh, sent some support shots and then dropped the rest into Kiangsu. That's 13 infantry and change there in Kiangsu, but pulling back land units from just about everywhere else in China as these forces continue to mass closer and closer to Shanghai. So um, Japan is not out of the woods by any stretch. It's still got quite a few forces coming at them. Um, albeit so far from one fewer direction, so um, the battle continues to rage. The Russians on the European front have continued to maximize their economic advantage while slowly pulling back their offensive units. So we've got incursions here into um, Eastern Europe, Southeastern Europe here. Um, as well as Norway, as one should have expected. Um, get as much money as they can. So Germany, having bought with all of its British money, uh, a stack of 10 artillery and 10 mechs here in Northern Europe, certainly signaling that it's ready to push the Russians back uh, and supported by this uh, Italian stack as well. So Russians getting the message and pulling their offensive units back to uh, Belarus, but taking uh, as many pot shots at undefended territories as possible. So Germany took Poland, Russia took it back, Russia took these two territories here, still holding on to Romania while pulling back. So um, Russia collected 70, 70 IPCs this turn, which is absurd. Uh, Germany no longer getting that influx of cash from London and being cash strapped uh, for bonuses under our rules, um, making significantly less than that. So what will the Allies do to squeeze the vice on Japan even more in turn five? Well, that remains to be seen. As we reach the beginning of turn six, the Allies certainly have momentum behind them. So you'll see the Americans, instead of setting up a northern Russian invasion and shuck-shuck line like uh, we thought they may have and what their strategy kind of portended, we've uh, shifted down to the Hawaiian locus of power, as is a common... Um, set up for the Americans slash and Zakistanis. Um, the Australians have uh, retaken all their bonus islands, and so they're all set up with their income stream again. Their navy is positioned to join forces, forces with the Americans, and we um, quite literally have a ring of military power here circling around the Pacific. Quite a uh, different distribution of naval units uh, to what we had just a couple turns ago with the Allies really kind of showing up in force here in the Pacific. Uh, and same goes on the Chinese mainland as the multinational force consolidates now in Anhui. Uh, again, entirely foreseeable. Um, doesn't make it any nicer, because that is a whole lot of dudes right there. Uh, and doesn't matter how many I put in Kiang Su, 
he's going to have more there in Anway. So it is, uh, it portends something not very nice for the Japanese. Um, on the European side, so the uh, British took everything they possibly could to ensure that once and for all, this guy in Italian Somaliland was taken out. And he put up a valiant fight, but alas, he died. Um, more than that, though, it consolidates uh, British power there in one spot, gets all those carriers on planes, all the infantry together with their um, transports, and gives them the capability to project power uh, more cleanly than they could before. Uh, seeing the numbers in Egypt, Italy pulled back to regroup in southern Europe, and regroup they have, uh, bringing all the land units that were there into Greece, and uh, encircling the invading Russian army uh, with all the land forces they've been building up the last few turns. Uh, now with an aircraft carrier and another transport to build up the naval projection as well. Um, and you'll see they came to the aid of their German brethren, uh, taking back Romania and Poland and even Eastern Poland, uh, as well as you, or I said Romania, but, um, did they take, I guess they did take Romania just then. Um, they took Yugoslavia as well with, uh, quite a bit of force. So that actually changed hands. That's income to the Italians now. Um, so with the Italians paving the road for the Germans, uh, remains to be seen how far they'll get down it in turn six. All right, strategic interlude here. And you can tell by the disappointment in my voice that I've realized uh, these past two Japanese turns I've played entirely wrongly. So I talked earlier about how uh, with Japan, I was thoroughly tempted to do some other things, but I felt like I needed to do the conservative thing, which was pull my fleet back from Hawaii into C zone six and start dealing with all these land units. I mean, that needed to be done. Uh, if I hadn't uh, dealt with the Russians up there, you know, that would have been a problem. Um, I felt like pushing back on this was useful and keeping me economically going. Um, but, you know, the Americans have been able to pull this together so much more quickly. Um, here's the two things I was tempted to do. One of them was probably a bad idea. The other one would have been a good idea. Um, the one idea was to take my entire fleet and just wipe out the American fleet in C-Zone 1. I could have done that so easily. My fleet was so much bigger. It had easy access. He'd even moved his planes out of there, um, to defend against these two subs in C-Zone 10, um, which never really would have happened. So, um, and I would have had enough fleet even to survive the counter strike from what was there that had been built up. So I would have had a fleet in C zone one. He would have had none. And if he had actually come in and attacked me with all those capital ships, uh, I may yet have gotten that victory token for taking all those out. Um, that, however, would have left me without planes at all in this theater. And more likely than not, Shangtung would have fallen, or Shanghai rather, would have fallen as a result. And that would have given him a victory token um, and just kicked me out of Asia entirely. And that would have left me with no army, no money, and no hope. Um, the second thing, now here's a plan. And if you roll back the tape a couple turns, you can remember what this setup was like. But... I could block him. You know, he he was still over there in C-Zone 1. I knew that he was coming, but um, here's my initial idea. was I was going to build a naval base in Hainan and an air base in Hong Kong where I could have landed the four plane, or the, all the planes from the carriers. Um, and what that would have done, swing all my Navy down to 36 with the idea that on the next turn... I go three zones into Calcutta. All the planes from Quang Tung could have made it and landed on the carriers. And I would have had enough in my transports to take Calcutta. That was a plan I was cooking up all last night. It was going to be perfect. All I had to do was take out the guys in Quang C to keep them from attacking my planes in Hong Kong. And I would have been okay. 
The reason I didn't go for that was there were two, I think there was a destroyer and a cruiser or something right here in 54 that could have popped over to 37, blocked the progression of those uh, naval units and thus thrown that plan off. So I abandoned it. Um, that was the right choice, obviously, because I couldn't have pulled off Calcutta. Last turn, in the way that I did play the game, I was very close to taking all these transports and most of the planes on these carriers coming down into the Philippines and taking this out. Now, hes I would have needed all that because he's got seven, eight guys there in a plane. Um, and so I would have needed that support in order to take the Philippines. Uh, Hamden Hawd went back and forth on that, um, knowing that that would have taken precious land units and airplanes out of the Asian theater for a whole turn, um, let him get uncomfortably close to overrunning Shanghai and didn't want to take that chance. So I played it defensively. Um, and I also was looking at this Australian fleet thinking, well, the land units that lived from that invasion, there wouldn't have been very many of them. Um, and I probably would have gotten out of there the next turn. So I have Philippines for one turn. So what? Yeah, it's it's helpful. It gives me some money. It takes a bonus away from the U.S. Um, but I didn't think it was the best long-term play. So I played it defensively. Well, here's why I think that was a bad idea. Um, they couldn't have taken it back right away, right? They had, it's They're two turns away from Philippines, which means my next turn. Yeah, he would have responded by bringing these Americans up to C zone 16, where there's currently a blocker, but then he's knocking on my door. Um, I could have brought all the carriers, all the big units, all the battleships back up to C zone 6 because this is a naval base I would be able to reach. But those transports could have gone right here to these oh so precious money islands. And that's where I was thinking way too small. Thinking a fortress mentality in. Asia, which is never a winning strategy. A fortress mentality is always a loser because eventually you're going to cave. Um, I was looking for ways to break out. I didn't see it. If I would have just kept building infantry in Shangtung, I think I would have lived long enough uh, to give myself the ability to send those transports down here to the Money Islands. And take those precious, precious IPCs out of here. That's so much money. That is 15 plus another 5. That's 20 IPCs coming in. Yeah, and would these Australians have come and started pecking away at that? Sure. Kept, some, kept them from floating up to the Americans, though. Uh, and would have gotten me a lot of income in the meantime. But you know what? Those... Transports would have died pretty quickly. Um, and Asia would have been in a bad way. I had some money to buy some new transports, though. And I don't know. I just feel like ultimately that would have been a better move. A much better move. More aggressive, for sure. And Japan could use some aggression right now. Because I just collected 28. And Japan should not be in the 20s at this time of the game. And here's the other thing. Um, the way that this American Allied Navy is right now, I don't see me getting another chance to do that next turn. I come down to the Philippines, and now the Australians are in striking range, um, so I don't get a chance to get to the Money Islands. And the Chinese, among others, keep building up here in Asia I'll run the numbers, see what they look like next time. I got a lot of stuff parked there. I keep building guys too, so me and China anyway are kind of at a stalemate. But with the addition of all these other guys uh, coming in, and yeah, there aren't many Russians coming anymore. Um, there aren't as many Indians, certainly not land units, but he just built two planes and he's going to keep flying those up. And he has some more guys are trickling in. I mean, ultimately, this isn't a winner for Japan, uh, especially when I have to work so hard to get every last dollar. And he is spending 70-something he got last turn, and he's putting all his money in the Pacific. 
Now, he's doing exactly what I wanted him to do at the beginning of the game, which was pour money into the Pacific and leave Germany alone. But, um, you know, Germany did what it's supposed to do, and it's now doing pretty good. Italy's doing pretty good, but Japan, Japan's hurting as a result. Um, and I'll tell you, one thing that Germany's doing uh, at, in response to that is trying to help their Japanese buddies out by taking some American pressure off of them. That's why I reconfigured the fleet here. Because I'm looking at this. And I got a huge stack, but he's got a huge stack. Um, if I keep pressing my advantage with these land units, get them up there, will I ever overcome this stack up here? Maybe eventually. Um, but maybe a better approach right now is stalemate and pour enough in there to hold but not necessarily try and conquer Russia while I spend uh, what little extra advantage I have, what little extra income I have uh, beyond that and try to put some pressure on the U.S. So this fleet here with still 11 uh, transports and I added those destroyers so that when these guys go floating off they can at least deal with these subs that are coming at them. I wanted to buy, buy a couple more subs, take advantage of the wolf pack, and be able to put some more offensive naval capability in there. Um, I couldn't get away with investing too much in the Navy without tipping my hand and, and kind of tipping the strategic balance a little too much. But nine infantry there to hop on those transports. I got some extra stuff up in Norway that can go on. These now from 112 can either go up to... Sea zone 123 to Iceland and kind of take that route again that we talked about at the very beginning of the game uh, or come down here to sea zone 91. And then either both of those things, of course, threaten North America. Sea zone 91 also portends uh, an invasion of South America, which is extra IPCs. Uh, and of course, with a bonus of plus two per American territory, these three little no-name places in South America become very valuable. And the idea being once the U.S. sees a credible threat to the Atlantic, maybe he'll have to start spending some money over here. And now that's actually something I want him to do, take a little pressure off Japan. Because, boy, right now, the overall approach to this game, I think, is actually working okay there there's some real promise i think to this strategy uh you know not some of the tactics we talked about obviously but the strategy of coming out hard against the u.s in the pacific keeping them off germany's back um but boy the execution and maybe you know a couple decisions along the way <sighs> maybe it wasn't good enough and maybe i'm not maybe i'm thinking too small in germany now too that is often my problem is I get too conservative halfway through the game when the axis doesn't need to be conservative. Um, maybe I need to be pressing this advantage. That's another reason why I bought infantry and kept these guys in 112 instead of moving them out even farther because I still have the option to double back and dump all that stuff on the Russian front. You see, he moved these ships here. That's actually, I don't know why he did that exactly. It's probably just slowing me down from a Leningrad invasion next turn. But um, that lets me kill them and then non-com all the way up here to 115 if I want to and not have to worry about that um, scramble into the naval battle. So a lot to think about, but you know, also a lot's going to happen before I get to the next German turn. So those are my thoughts right now. Beginning of round seven, and the Allies are tightening the noose even further in the Pacific by just piling an absurd amount of naval power in the Caroline Islands now, inching closer naval base by naval base to the Japanese mainland. Um, in the meantime, the Allied ground units uh, close even closer in on Shanghai, taking back uh, most of those coastal zones that had been reoccupied by Japan last turn. 
and just giving Japan even less freedom of movement in the Pacific Island. It is not a comfortable position to be in on this side of the board. The Australians getting all their bonuses back are building a carrier per turn. Calcutta just built a carrier. We've got this little fleet going on here in the Persian Gulf. Um, that is quite a bit of naval power building up. Now, here's a plus side for the Axis. The uh, Italians uh, reoccupying Egypt and building a factory there, meaning to stay this time. The uh, British are content with building some tanks and such and some things in their Persian factory. While on the Europe side, the Italians have finished pushing the Soviets out of Germany's territory there, taking back Romania, positioning some guys in Greece, buying, like I said, that factory, some planes, uh, moving the naval units forward. The Atlantic stays quiet, but Europe's going to heat up even further here in turn seven. Well, here we are at middle of turn seven, and um, boy, the Japanese Navy and its uh, expansion has collapsed a lot quicker than I would have liked. Uh, after sitting here and weighing the options for a long time, um, there's no plausible way for Japan to continue to defend um, the waters around Shanghai and the home islands at the same time. So uh, consistent with that unfortunate fortress mentality we've been following here we are now holed up in C zone 6 Now there's a lot there and uh, they're not going to get in at least not on the first try and there is quite a retaliatory capability there for now but in the face of all this navy and all this ground force here it's hard to imagine it's going to be enough to last much longer. Japan is on its last legs, kind of holed up here, turtled in the home islands. And that's really not where you want to see Japan. Uh, which is a crying shame because Italy and Germany are going off the charts now. Um, we already know that Italy is super powerful. Um, Germany uh, positioned everything. I almost threw in the transports full into Baltic states there. That would have made those transports too vulnerable, though, so we hung back. But they are ready and able to dump a whole lot in there next turn. Recognizing that, running all those odds, um, Russia in a similar boat to Japan, realizing that it cannot continue to hold all that territory anymore and pulling back to its capital. Difference between Russia and Japan is that Russia's got a whole crap ton more of strategic depth that Germany and Italy have to pile through before they can get to the capital. Um, and not as many victory tokens to pick up along the way. So uh, that is a tight spot. The access to be in, and it's a real shame because uh, Germany's about to do some fun stuff here at the beginning of turn eight. Um, you know, if the Allies let them get there. All right, so this is my second attempt to shoot this portion of the closing video. The first one didn't record for some reason, but um, to the chagrin of many, myself included. Uh, we've decided to throw in the towel for the Axis at this point. Um, Chris and I both have a busy lives, which is why it's been two years since we've been able to pull off a game like this. And uh, this game you just witnessed was shot over one long weekend. Uh, we've got too many business and family days and commitments coming up over the next month or so to make it worth um, playing the rest of this game out because... Um, I think we both agree that it's not going to go in the Axis' favor. 
Um, so as I've mentioned before, I tried to pull off a, a kill US first strategy, or at least, you know, kneecap US first strategy. Um, and ultimately the execution of that didn't work out very well. Um, and, you know, after contemplating it, the first thing I really regret was not taking that opportunity to knock out the fleet in C Zone 1. Obviously, my intention had been to knock out or cripple the U.S. fleet sooner than that. Uh, never got the opportunity with the blockers and then not have enough movement points to get in there uh, enough to knock it out convincingly and still survive the counterattack. Uh, until uh, that turn where they were in Season 1, which is still much later in the game than I originally wanted uh, to pull that off. So that's the first thing. Coming back. So that's, uh, that's ultimately why we ended up where we are. Because the Season uh, 1 fleet lived combined with a new fleet and Chris continued to pour 70-something IPCs into the Pacific every turn, uh, while at the same time, Japan just didn't have that uh, economic engine in order to keep up with the U.S. like it usually does, right? That's why we end up with a stalemate navally in the Pacific most times is because Japan and the U.S. are spending about roughly equal money in the Pacific. Um, Japan just couldn't do that. Um, the second thing I regret with Japan is even after having made that decision, after having pulled my fleet back, I still had a turn, uh, where I could have safely brought the fleet down to the Philippines, take that, and then from there on to the Money Islands. And Calcutta, while, you know, doing yeoman's work here, bringing up all these land units, certainly was weak navally, even even from an Air Force perspective, uh, was weak. Uh, weak enough that it couldn't contend with that fleet. And I think I had an extra turn where that could have been a possibility. And then that really would have kick-started uh, my economic engine. Again, I decided against that because I knew the U.S. fleet was coming and ultimately because uh, with the even with the Australian fleet and these transports coming up here, I knew I was going to have to bring my transports back because that's the most important way that this fleet was contributing to the land war, which was by dumping uh, additional land units, being able to retake these coastal t territories. Um, and I didn't want to take the, ter the, the transport shuck shuck out of commission for a turn or even more. So I ultimately decided not to do that. But that that's fortress mentality thinking. Uh, when you're just, you know, drawing a, a line and trying to defend... Uh, the, your, your own little circle within that line, uh, you're ultimately going to fail because you're not expanding, you're not growing, uh, you're only going to continue to shrink and shrink. And so that's just not a way to win a battle. So ultimately, those kind of uh, mid-game course corrections and uh, hesitancies, I think, were not necessarily bad, but ill-suited to this strategy is what I would conclude. Um, on the German side, the Italian side, hey, you know, life is great. Um, obviously, the, the decision that led to a loss of Air Force in C-Zone 111 on turn one slowed down the progress from the beginning. I, I'm actually amazed that I pulled off um, uh, the Sea Lion as well as, as it came out to happen. And as quickly as it happened with G3, C line still ended up being plausible. Um, we went for turn four, dumped in Scotland instead, but it was still on the table to even consider. And that in itself is amazing given the amount of Air Force that was lost. Um, but of course, the, the whole reason they were able to pull off any of this was the fact that ja Japan was taking one for the team, right? Japan was completely occupying the US, so the Atlantic was quiet. Uh, allowing Germany and especially Italy, since it didn't get Tarantoed, um, to blow up. And so that was, you know, that, that's the result of a good plan. Um, good coordination with Japan. It's just Japan wasn't able to hold up its end of the bargain long enough, uh, to secure the victory. So 
That's my conclusion. Uh, I, I think that uh, a kill U.S. first strategy still has some merit and some life to it. Um, I'd love to, I wish I could roll back the tape and, you know, if this were a video game, I'd just uh, quit and, you know, load up a save game and uh, see how it would have gone if I had done that turn a little differently. Can't do that here. Um, you know, would be interesting to see if there's another variation of the theme. Um, uh, keep in mind, too, that th th there's one other failing of the original plan, of course. We talked about this in one of my side videos was, you know, a critical tactic on, on the beginning of this strategy had been to kind of float Calcutta Crush style all the way to San Francisco. It wasn't until I was halfway through turn one when I realized that was against the rules, right? Because I hadn't read that part of the rule book. We'd never done it before, so it hadn't even occurred to me to wonder if it could be done. Um, so that's just a, you know, that's a plug for, hey, reread the rules before you play a game that you're going to spend all weekend on. Uh, and so that caused a turn one course correction on the tactics, but the strategy was still the same. Overall point of the strategy, we, we still got a chance to test and it was still a mighty enjoyable game. I really enjoyed keeping Chris on his toes, trying new strategies he hadn't seen before. Um, and that, frankly, I hadn't seen before either. Uh, and that's fun when you're, you know, it, it, playing your umpteenth uh, iteration of the same game. You want to try different things every time and see what works. So Chris is here on FaceTime, uh, dialing in live from Texas, as we've done uh, throughout the game. And Chris, do you have commentary of your own at this point? Yeah, I mean, just a little bit. Um, I thought, again, the FaceTime game worked pretty well, all things considered. The, you know, one drawback is there's always a piece here or there that's out of position. You sort of just got to navigate those, but none of those were outcome critical. Um, when you floated the Navy to Hawaii and then just sort of sat him there, um, sort of figured what was happening. Um, and I calculated the odds. I don't think there was any way that I would have survived an attack uh, on turn two on the Navy. Um, would have obviously brought the U.S. into the war and uh, given you a victory token right out of the gate, which I actually think is what you should have done. Because the other thing that I kept waiting to happen... See, so when the sea line was on the board and Japan had moved its Navy over there. I knew that you were coming for the U S and at the same time coming for London. Uh, and I couldn't afford to strip the planes out of the UK cause I was going to have to deal with Japan, which means Toronto was off the board, which limited a lot of the things that you're going to be able to do uh, on the Europe side of the board. So you have to, pretty quickly make a decision on which side you're going to go. I thought you were actually not going to do Sea Lion. Uh, I thought that those boats, uh, turn three, were going to go to Gibraltar, and then turn four go to a very vacantly occupied eastern United States, because I had dealt, uh, I think I made some mistakes in my buys on turn one and two, and focusing on the Navy uh, and not solidifying ground forces anywhere that I would need to in America to ward off a two front attack. Cause the thing about kill America first is I think you got to do some of the killing of the America part and that never actually happened in this version of the strategy, not only cause you didn't go for the Navy, but because you never actually landed a single unit or transport near America that would have taken any of the territories or even threatened any of the territories. But that opening move, you know, I've been thinking about it all day of, of you know, just because it didn't work in this game doesn't mean that there's not a really, really good strategy in the core of there. So turn one, go to Japan. Turn two, wipe out the Navy, get a token. America has to build up its force there. And then the next turn, it's coming from the other side. Japan's constantly feeding and reinforcing. You're going to have to give up, I think, uh, parts of what you traditionally do 
uh, in Asia, use the forces that are there to sort of hold that while you focus almost everything on the U.S. Because if you can take the U.S. out of the game in the first four or five turns, there's no one coming to help the rest of the board. So I think you win in the long, long game. But, uh, you know, it was very, very interesting when it happened. I never had actually played a game. I'd read a bunch of the commentary, obviously, in the, the, the message boards and wh- where it goes. I didn't recall any of the sort of counter strategies in real time until later. And I wasn't going to stop the game so I could, like, study on what to do. Uh, I think in retrospect, if I had to do it over again as the United States, I would do something completely indifferent, dramatically different, which I'm not going to say now because I have a suspicion we're going to play this game uh, again in the near future, and I'm going to save that back there. Uh, but I actually thought over the at the end of turn two that I was going to lose this game until you turned around, and then I knew I was going to win because the at that point Russia was going to get too big, the U.S. was going to get too big, I wasn't losing money anywhere. I was only gaining money. You weren't getting bonuses. All of your lean in on your moves were towards uh, strategies that don't result in bonuses. So they're not incentivized in our version of the rules. Um, The payoff of doing that, of course, is if you could knock the U.S. out of the game, then you're probably going to win. But we never got to that point. So I'd like to see the version of the strategy where that happens. I think that would be a... uh, pretty interesting version of the uh, the move so kudos to brian good strategy good thought uh you know i think that was a uh, very clever uh move to sort of try something different um it's funny every time we finish a game my immediate thought was god i really want to play the axis next time and then we like start setting up the board i'm like nah, just go play the allies again so maybe one of these days i'll uh, i'll play a version of the axis so good game enjoyed it can't wait for the next one. It was good times. The other problem with this, which I recognize from the beginning, is that um, I only get one shot to surprise you with this. Now, every time we play, you know, Kill US First is going to be a, a plausible option in your playbook. And you're instead of throwing out your playbook on turn one, you're, you're going to have a section for that. So uh, I can only surprise you with it once. True, but just because I know it's coming doesn't mean I can stop it. Um, I can play more efficiently against it than I did this time. Um, But I think the counter to it still slows down what the U.S. would otherwise be pre-positioned to do on terms three and four in Europe. You know, in my traditional playbook strategy of, you know, Toronto, keep Italy small, build in the Middle East, Middle Earth up, support planes, and then use have the U.S. to cripple Europe. Um, that all is dependent upon heavy U.S. investments on that side of the board. And anything that requires me to build up a bunch of meaningless forces in either the homeland, whether it be Navy in the Pacific or just infantry in the western U.S. to defend against a landing, those are garbage buys. Uh, I mean, sure, I can ship those guys off five, six turns later, but that's a whole lot of IPCs that you get no return on investment for, which was my criticism of what actually happened here. I mean, you had the whole Japanese Navy, you know, 200-something IPCs of capital ships and naval support and planes just sitting in Hawaii for three turns, not taking territory, not building an economy, not killing units, just, you know, it was pinning me down, but it wasn't using that early leverage to, to open up a gap. Um, so I, I do agree with what you were saying about sort of if you're going to do it, you have to smash through to wipe that Navy out and accomplish sort of what the objective is and let the dice fall where they may, even if it means that you have to come back in and wipe China out later. I think you got to, you, you know, win, hold, win. The first part of that is you got to win one of the boards. You can't sort of hold them both. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to see that version, even if I knew it was coming. Yeah, there was a a point in time where um, I could have smashed you. Part of the part of the issue was you held me at bay. There was a turn I intended to destroy your navy, but you held me at bay with destroyer blockers over here, and then uh, I so I couldn't get to you that turn, and I was starting to get frustrated with how 
long the fleet had been away from the Asia side of the board because I'd hoped to, you know, score a quick hit, even if it didn't completely kill you, um, but cripple you and then come back and deal with the other guys before they got too big. There was a turn I could also have smashed through one of the destroyers in C Zone 9 and then still consolidated the C Zone 6 forces there in 9 and then hit you the next time where you couldn't have blocked me. Um, although you could, still could have come south, left another blocker. Um, I don't know. I mean, the, there was, there was the back and forth with the blockers that I just didn't think I could get my consolidated fleet there in time to accomplish anything. Um, but then you, you set me up when you pulled back to sea zone one and didn't leave a destroyer blocker out. That was the one time I actually had direct access to you with my entire fleet. Yeah. So I, I looking at it, when I was in sea zone one, that was season turn three, I shot out to four and mm -hmm. then built up enough of the defenses that I knew you wouldn't be able to take the Western U S so that th there would be a requirement that you'd have to sort of do something with that Navy. I don't think you just let me hang on a four. And then you pulled back to Japan, which is exactly what I thought you did. And because there's not a sea base there, I could only make it to one. Mm -hmm. But on that turn, I also built another nascent Navy south of there, which would have allowed me to prevent you from getting that token. But... I would have stripped off a number of your Navy. Your Navy would have been substantially out of position with no naval base, so that he would have had to limp back one, two, giving me another turn of buys there. And at that point, I think your economy was at 40, 35, and I was at 70, so I figured I could outspend you uh -huh. on a naval arms race. So true, the bulk of the day, that's one of the reasons why I stripped those planes off, because I knew I was going to lose that Navy. I didn't want those planes, too, because I wanted them for the second war, um, but by that time I was coming into the war. I think this works only if you move the Navy into Y1 and 2, you can bust through, and if there, even if there's a destroyer blocker there, at least get into the next ring so that you can get in, or if they put up those destroyer blockers, then head down to Queensland to, to do something. Um, well, that's the other thing, is that because I hadn't attacked Hawaii, I didn't have the Hawaii naval base. So you, you said before you thought I was going to go down to Queensland. Well, I couldn't have actually gotten to Queensland without that naval base boost. No, that's true. So I could have... I guess you could have taken Hawaii on two and gone to Queensland on three, right? Uh, yeah, although you had thrown up a, an Australian blocker at that point, too. What I could have done is come down to Caroline's. Um, could I do that? No, I mean, even the Carolines is out of range unless you have a, a naval base. So the, the move, movement was, I was, there was always like one thing off that stopped me from doing what we're describing, right? Getting into the position where I could actually accomplish something. So I was being slowed down to the point where I needed two turns to do something that should happen in one turn. And there's just too many of those things in a row to allow me to do anything efficient. That's why I keep fixating on the turn where I could have hit you in C-Zone 1. Because that was the first opportunity I had to hit you with the combined fleet of what was in Hawaii and what was in C-Zone 6. Right. Yeah. So it, it's, it's not that I didn't try to do those things. Um, you, you made the right moves to forestall me long enough that I was... I was, you know, I knew I was going to be out of position, but I would have to get even further out of position to accomplish anything, and had it taken more turns than I wanted to take, to the point where I just, I didn't think I could commit to that many more turns before I brought the fleet home. Yeah, I tell you, I, I don't know that there's a better unit in the water than the destroyer. I mean, fine subs operate the the the, the, the destroyer as blocker to prevent so many naval invasions is so clutch. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I bought so many destroyers this game because I just kept feeding them in to buy one more turn, buy one more turn, until mm -hmm. uh, I could get the economy going to keep pace. Yeah. Yeah, it just uh, didn't come together. Now, on the Europe map, you talk about bringing the boats down to 91. That I mean, that's why I built them all in 112 instead of 111. 
uh, or 113 rather, um, so that I had the option to do that. And frankly, that was my plan after, um, after Sea Lion. Well, I'm gonna think, let me think about that. After Sea Lion, it was my plan. I, I thought about even skipping Sea Lion and going down, but, um, Sea Lion was always a, a critical portion of my plan anyway. Um, it didn't have to be, but I, I figured I had that Navy. Um, and especially after my whole, like, you know, Alberta landing zone thing didn't work out. I thought, well, I have the ability to do sea land. I ought to do that, get it done, get an income boost, and then maybe threaten the U.S. Um, but even after I did sea line, it was on the table. But until I ran the numbers and realized, like, just how absurdly I could overpower Leningrad. And that's why you pulled back, right? Because the numbers were just stupid. Um, I, I could walk in there without any Air Force support, uh, frankly, without another influx of uh, land units from the transports and still walk over it. And that was a victory token, right? That, that was the last victory city I needed with Egypt gone uh, in order to get another token for Germany. So that was too tempting. Um, but I was either... I had very much contemplated and at one point planned on either going to 91 or going up to Iceland um, and either, you know, using the Iceland folks to drop off in northern Canada or buy a naval base, which is something mentioned in kind of one of the online versions of this strategy, get a naval base in Iceland so that in one turn I can threaten both D.C. and Ottawa. Um, and that's... That's, that's another portion of why I wanted to do Sea Lion, because if I could take both London and Ottawa in a game, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. But you're right, making you build both in the Navy and in the Eastern Sea Zone, Eastern U.S., to, to defend yourself against simultaneous invasions would have been the ultimate outcome here. Um, that just, you know, that wasn't in the cards for this particular iteration. Now, the, the one thing I will say, sort of the, the reason why I think you almost had to swing back around as Germany is when sea line were coming, um, it was, you know, Russia was ready to pounce as soon as it could. Mm -hmm. So America took five or six, and if you had taken 20 units off the board in the other, other direction, I don't know that you would have been able to hold them. Well, and that, that is definitely the thing. With as many... Um, of my territories as you had. I mean, Italy had to invest in land units as it did. And, you know, its stack was helpful, but I, I absolutely had to uh, build all entirely like I did in, uh, up in here and reinforce those with the tanks that I'm bringing back from London. Um, so yeah, you're right. There, there was, there was no way. And I wasn't bringing necessarily 20 um, at that point, but I would have taken the seven tanks, which are the units that most need to be in Germany at that point, plus all the backup infantry that I could have built in Western, and taking those out of Europe would have would have spelled disaster over here. Yeah, because I mean, at that point, I had four turns of full Russian buys. Yeah. Um, you know, tanks and support, and I was on the move. I mean, obviously, what, with, with the decision to sort of pull back the Navy and the German forces, I had to retreat. I mean, I, I did pull out of Leningrad because that was a, a kill zone. I had written off 18 infantry in Belarus that were going to get wiped out on the next turn only because I needed that speed bump to get everything else back to Moscow under the theory that by the time you got there, if we kept playing this game up, I, I think I'd have probably 50 or 60 guys, a dozen planes, a dozen tanks. Um, it would have been difficult to get in there right away. And what I was buying for with, with basically Russia at the end of the game was just to lose Moscow. Right. Um, you know, you could have the rest of Russia because if I take Japan and don't lose Russia, I win. So, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the armchair objection is going to be, well, just take Moscow, he takes Tokyo, then it's an even fight still. Uh, and sure, that, that's true. I don't know that we've ever successfully pulled that off, though, because uh, literally every time I'm knocking on Moscow's door, you're able to start supplementing Moscow with British planes. 
And, you know, they wouldn't have been coming from London this time, but they would have been coming from Persia here. And, you know, it, Italy might have been able to get there this time, though. That's the thing is, you know, I was knocking on Persia's door. But with J Japan out of the game, then the Indians would have started bringing more stuff. You're already building up a sizable navy here. Um, you know, real question whether or not... And heck, even if I take Persia, you've got Calcutta to start flying planes up there, and you're going to fly them back from Asia. So, uh, inevitably, you would have been able to hold out long enough for everybody else to turn back and squeeze Russia, uh, squeeze Germany and Italy. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the answer to the armchair generals is, is that they're, they're correct, but not based on the positioning of the board, because you're still three or four turns away from even being in a position, let's say three turns, to, to, to even getting into Moscow. And I don't need to take Japan in order to limit what they can do. I mean, the Japanese economy at this point is the same size as Anzac. Yeah. Uh, so I could take a turn or two off of U.S. buys and maintain balance of power in the Pacific. And then once I have 200 IPCs of transports and obviously all the guys that I bought in the Western are going to the Central, so I don't need to rebuy those guys. If I have a credible threat of landing on this coast, then you can't feed in to the Russian army. And that's coming in the next one, two, three turns. So by the time you get there, your supply lines are going to be dwindling. And then I could shift back over and dump, you know, resources in there. So I don't, I don't need to take Japan right now. Japan is bottled up so I can come back and spend resources on here so that I don't lose Russia, right? Win, hold, mm. win. Yeah, I mean, that's true. Um, inevitably, the U.S. invasion takes a while to oh, yeah. build up. I mean, you've got no Navy there right now, right? So it's going to take a couple builds to then build up, then get over here, then actually be able to dump enough land units that it matters. So Germany's got at least a couple turns before it has to worry about that. True. I think it has a couple of turns. Um, but I've already can on, on, on the next turn. And, and let's keep in mind in Western Europe there are nothing, so you're already going to have to have something there to start pulling back. You have a little bit of a navy in Germany, but not, not much that I have to worry about it coming down and wiping out everything that I got. So I don't need a big force, and I can be supplementing it at every turn to make sure that I don't lose it. Um, you know, the, the key is just to slow the supply line so that every turn that you have to wait is another 10 infantry that I get to put in Russia, and I can move up another one or two planes from, from India um, to, to be slowing them down. So, I mean, I do think based on where we're at on the board, we've made the correct call. I think that the, this is going to be an Allies win. I don't think it's an Allies win for the next couple of turns because... I'm going to have to let Japan simmer and marinate for a few, few minutes for a few turns to make sure that you're busy in Western Europe so that you can't take Moscow. So, I mean, yes, if I take Japan and you take Russia, it's a fair fight, which is why we can't let that happen. we got to keep Russia, bottle up Japan, and then take Japan turn 12. Yeah. Yeah, well... If there wasn't... An... The, the, the three subs you're buying a turn, I'm not really not worried about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, there there might be, like, breakout battles over here every now and then. You might give me a target of opportunity, but Japan's not accomplishing much anymore. Correct. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, rather than um, spend what precious few hours we're going to have now going forward over the next month in order to work all that out because that's how long it would take um makes sense to call it here good read good game always fun indeed indeed um already contemplating the next strategy all right. play actress next time <laughs> <laughs> Of course, the last time I played Axis, I couldn't take France, so I have no, no idea what the hell I'm talking about. So. <laughs> well, talk about mixing it up. You know that that would be that would be a game changer right there to take it from the other end. All right, good stuff. All right, dude. All right, see y'all. All right, man. Take it easy.
Final bonus shot for those of you who made it all the way to the end of the video. Uh, just a quick little plug. This is the rig that I've used to shoot this in the last uh, couple game videos that I've posted. Um, this is a wide angle lens that snaps onto the back of the iPhone case and gives me a much broader field of view uh, to be able to capture more of the board in the shot. This is a little rig with a MagSafe uh, spot for the camera to go, uh, as well as a uh, handy dandy little light, as well as a fuzzy microphone that plugs right into the phone. So if you've noticed a, a different look to the video um, than previous shots, that's why. Uh, love to get your feedback on whether that's easier and, and, and more uh, gratifying, more visually pleasing to watch, uh, or if you'd prefer uh, a normal, just built-in iPhone camera view uh, like the one you're looking at now. But anyway, thanks for watching.